afternoon, Professor Meyerson, um, the president of the university, um, Associate Professor Sawani Tairung Road, Mr. Uwe Moraves, founding chairman of the International Peace Foundation, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dusani Gesawayud um, from School of Economics. I will be your MC for today afternoon event. On behalf of the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce and the International Peace Foundation, I'm greatly honored to welcome you to the fourth ASEAN event series, Bridges Dialogue Toward a Culture of Peace. It is our great pleasure and privilege to have Professor Roger Meyerson with us today. Professor Meyerson will give us the speech on leadership, democracy, and local government. To mark the formal opening of the event in Thailand, and also we have this event carry on in Vietnam for this year. Professor Meyerson is a 2007 Nobel laureate for economics who has made seminal contributions to the field of economics and political science. His works on mechanism design and game theory play a central role in many areas of our life. For example, um, efficient trading mechanism, regulation scheme, auction processes, and voting procedures. Professor Meyerson has also extended his contribution to political science. His works using economic analysis of political institution help us to understand how political incentives can be affected by different electoral system and constitutional structures. These work also help us to better understand the process of democratization. Currently, Professor Meyerson is a Glenn A. Loy Distinguished Service Professor of Economic at the University of Chicago. Now, um, I would like to invite Assistant President for Research of the University, Dr. Virachat Gilen Tong, to give a welcome remark. Thank you. Professor Rogers Meyerson, UTCC executives, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce, may I welcome all of you to our special lecture co-organized by the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce and the International Peace Foundation. UTCC has already organized 19 series of special lectures, most of them through the co cooperations with International Peace Foundation, to hold special lectures from Nobel laureates in economics. In the past, UTCC has had the honor of many Nobel laureates as follows. Professor James Heckman, 2000 Nobel laureate, Professor Robert A. Mondale, 1999 Nobel laureate. Professor Finn Kitlin, 2004 Nobel laureate. Professor Robert Engel, 2003 Nobel laureate. Professor Eric Maskin, 2007 Nobel laureate. As well as Mr. James Wolfelson, former president of the World Bank. May I thank Professor Roger Meyerson, Mr. Uwe Morovet, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, honorary guests, participants, and audience. I truly believe this lecture will provide a good forum, motivation, and inspiration for interesting people and public. All through this lecture, I can picture all of you as a caravan of peacemakers moving along the road to equality and harmony world. Thank you. Next, um, I would like to invite Mr. Uwe Moraves, founding chairman of the International Peace Foundation, to open the event.
สวัสดีครับ and welcome to the fourth ASEAN event series Bridges Dialogues towards a culture of peace Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation a non-political and non-religious foundation under the common patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna The events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including some of the country's main universities. And I would like to thank the, Thai Chamber, the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce and its president, Professor Sawani Thai Long Roach, for hosting our event today. Starting in November this year, bridges will now be continuously held in Thailand and Vietnam until March 2013 involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine and economics, as well as with other eminent keynote speakers, including the former president of the European Commission, Romano Prodi. The fourth ASEAN series of bridges follows the series of 450 events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia and Cambodia since November 2003, as an independent contribution to the decade for culture of peace and nonviolence, which was initiated by the United Nations General Assembly. The pluralistic program of Bridges highlights the International Peace Foundation's intercultural and interdisciplinary approach towards peace. The foundation does not take sides, but acts as a mediator by creating an independent platform for dialogue where representatives of science, politics, economy, culture, religion, the media, and youth can meet, share their viewpoints, listen to each other, and find mutual ways of understanding and cooperation. Therefore, the foundation itself is a bridge and a facilitator between different language groups in our divided societies, where politicians speak another language than artists, and business and religious leaders another one than scientists. In a highly interdependent world, problems cannot be solved by either one of these language groups only, but by working together. After the success of its British programs in Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia and Cambodia, the International Peace Foundation has been invited by other ASEAN countries to build further bridges towards peace and international cooperation by expanding its program in Southeast Asia to stimulate the intellectual, inter scientific, and cultural exchange here in the region. The fourth ASEAN Bridges series therefore continuously takes place in Thailand and Vietnam from November until March, comprising events with Nobel laureates from all fields. The Nobel laureates will visit the region not all at once, but separately to conduct public lectures, seminars, workshops, and dialogues hosted by local institutions during a continued period of five months. The aim of Bridges is to facilitate and strengthen dialogue and communication between societies in Southeast Asia with their multiple cultures and faiths, as well as with people in other parts of the world, to promote understanding and trust. The events aim at building bridges with local universities and other institutions in Southeast Asia to establish long-term relationships with Nobel laureates in all fields, which may result in common research programs and other forms of collaboration. By enhancing science, technology and education as a basis for peace and development, the events may lead to a better cooperation for the advancement of peace, freedom and security in the region with the active involvement of the young generation, ASEAN's key to the future. This is why Bridges is not held and designed as a one-time event, but as a continuing process of synergies to make the series of events a sustainable success for Thailand, for Vietnam and for ASEAN as a whole. I am grateful to the University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce for our long cooperation as well as to our other partners and sponsors who have enabled us to make the idea of bridges a reality. I would like to say thank you for everyone present today for taking part in this program. Maybe may it help us to facilitate a new culture of peace through dialogue 
transcending its defini definition as merely the absence of war or armed conflict into a new understanding what the basis for peace is, education. In this spirit, we welcome today the 2007 Nobel Laureate for Economics, Professor Roger Meyerson, who has agreed to come to Thailand to support the events. We all look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. Welcome, Professor Meyerson. It's a privilege to be here at the Thai, University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce to, to be your guest uh, of the International Peace Foundation. Uh, good. I was hoping that this would... There are some important supporters of the International Peace Foundation of this visit to, whose names are now being covered, but I'm glad to have the uh, slides down, if you don't mind. Uh, um, what I'd like to... Uh, I want to talk about... Uh, for this event, I wanted to talk about the most important questions that I... Uh, uh, that I thought I could raise and, 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 and uh, questions on which I think I'd like to, I can offer some insights or at least uh, pose uh, off, as, call for a, a different perspective, um, but questions that are very much open and on which I hope we'll have some dialogue. I think the, the experiences of this country, uh, uh, which I don't know enough about, uh, being, this being my first visit, uh, are, I think shed a lot of light on, on the questions of what makes a successful society, what are the keys to economic development and social development. Um, Adam Smith founded uh, Modern Economics with a book on the wealth of nations and that is the, a great question. What, what, what is the source of the great differences in the wealth of nations that we have observed? Um, an economic theorist formulates logical models to, to focus on these great questions. Uh, the models that we formulate, if they're going to give us insights, have to be consistent with, with data and with the broad patterns of world history. Um, I'm not going to talk, this is a non-technical lecture, so I'm not going to talk about any specific models in detail. I want to share with you insights that depend on my attempt to ask the question, what has been the secret for success of, 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 of great, of, of different countries in the world? I certainly am going to focus a, a lot on, on less, on what I think are the, are the unappreciated uh, aspects of the English system and the, and the American political system. Uh, that had something to do with the 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 early the early rise of of, of, of England to the industrial revolution and and the and, and, and the great success of, of of the of America in the world uh, the uh, the d great development of Asia during our time is an extraordinarily important process um, but. I, what I want to do is try to sketch to you one of the, some of the elements that I think are particularly important in understanding the basic conditions for successful democratic development as a way of understanding something of, of, of the great differences in wealth of nations. And I'm going to begin from a perspective. I'm an economist, but my understanding of economic theory is, a, is, is, is embedded in social science more generally. And so I do believe, and I do want to start with a view, that great differences in the wealth of nation depend on political foundations. So to understand why rich countries are rich, you have to understand something about the foundations of their legal and political systems. And so to understand economic development, we need to understand something about how effective states are, are built by political leaders. And, and political, that's what politicians do, is they, is they build our nations. They build governments. Um, 
I think one of the key insights that I want to focus on is that in investment is protected locally, but trade has to be pr protected nationally. And so development depends on both no local and national politics. So the question, the question I want to raise, uh, the, what I think the, the perspective I want to offer is to try to say, um, to understand how any country operates, we need, we need to think not just about how its presidents or prime ministers are chosen, but to understand how its structures of local leadership interact with structures of national leadership. Um, so let me just say a few words about how I think about politics as, as an economist. Um, we have to recognize that the state is a network of agents who enforce laws and sustain property rights. Um, I am part of a school of, I'm a game theorist, but we, 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 we work in, in, in the last 30 years, there's been a development of uh, the study of what we call information economics and agency theory in, in, in economics. Uh, this is about understanding transactions where people have difficulty trusting each other uh, because they have different information or uh, because, because people take actions that others can't perfectly observe. So we talk about adverse selection when people have, uh, are dishonest about their information. We talk about moral hazard uh, when, when, when people enter into transactions where they would like to have confidence that the other party in the transaction will do certain efforts correctly, but we have difficulty trusting that, that you have difficulty trusting I'm going to work hard in preparing my lecture and I have difficulty trusting uh, that my political leader will uh, actually deliver good governance rather than, uh, than stealing the public money. Um, moral hazard has, has featured a lot in discussions of our banking system in, in, the, in the various waves of financial crises we've seen in, in the world and that's another topic for another lecture. But agents of the state, our governments, in any country, in any society, this, this, the state is a network of agents who hold great power, some of them, uh, and they could profit from abuse of their power. And they have to be motivated, therefore, by, great, by an understanding that if providing good governance will have, have better rewards for the long term uh, than, uh, than what they could achieve by abusing their power. Uh, agency rents, I put bold face the word agency rents or moral hazard rents is a term in economics we use for the need to give people rewards not because they, they're, they're better or have earned but because if, if we don't reward them well they, they will be too, too sorely tempted uh, to, uh, to, to, to abuse their power. So who guarantees the, 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 that these agency rents will be paid. Ultimately, any political leader who's going to mobilize supporters under any political system to rise to high, high office and to high power in any society, any political leader needs first and foremost a reputation for reliably rewarding the services of active supporters and agents of, the, of, of the, his government, his or her government. And the state, of course, must be counted on to protect supporters' rights to these rewards. In some sense, that is the primary, from my perspective, as I try to understand how do societies work as a theorist, as I'm trying to understand how do any of our societies work, mine or yours, I understand the primary imperative in any society throughout history is the state's Need, the, le the political leaders need to protect the property rights of those people, those privileged people who are, are part of his political network. But the big question is, are property rights going to be protected only for a small elite who support the national leader? Or does the circle of trust extend to many more or all citizens of the country? Membership in a securely protected group requires some political power. To be a part of that 
group that the state will, will, will can, you can count on the state to protect you to own, own wealth, that requires that you have some voice, uh, some political power against a leader who, who fails to protect your rights. So that's a reason why uh, maybe you can understand why that's sometimes why in some societies in the history of humanity, uh, the privileges of protection of the state have been rather narrowly uh, distributed. And the rest of us have needed to be, to get our protection indirectly through net networks of patron-client relationships, a very common structure throughout human history in every civilization. But membership in the circle of trust means you can invest in the state. And I think the great miracle of modern economic growth depends more than anything else on the discovery that when a state gives good protection to all of its citizens, the engine of investment throughout the society enriches the whole country so much that, that the elite have a higher tax base and are ultimately better off. Uh, but let me, I want to give you a quote, a really remarkable quote from Adam Smith in his book Wealth of Nations of 1776. It's a longish quote, and I'm sorry that it's in, in English that, that I find a bit, well, it's 200, 250 year old English. But what he's saying, he says, he says, he's talking, let me read from the bottom line. He says, laws and customs that are favorable to yeomanry, that's a word that's gone out of my vocabulary, but I think he means uh, poor, free, free local people who, who don't necessarily own very much but are, are free citizens of England, uh, um, that there are laws and customs in England that, have, have, that are favorable to the status of, of these peasants and, and, and poor, citizen, poor local residents that have contributed more to the present grandeur of England than all of England's boasted regulations of commerce taken together. Let me tell you, we economists have mostly taken from Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations a view to the importance of good regulations of commerce. But he's saying that something else is more important. Now, what is it? He says, oh, uh, a lease, uh, uh, having uh, some, some lease of, of, of not, very much, not very much value, having a, a bit of rented land entitles you to vote for Parliament in England in 1776. And as a great part of these peasant farmers have such freeholds who, and therefore get to vote for members of Parliament, they become respectable. Now, there is nowhere in England, nowhere in the world, he says, except in England, an instance of a tenant farmer improving his land when he actually only has a lease and trusting that his landlord is not going to raise the rent after he improves the value of the land. And therefore, throughout England, he says that we have these small tenant farmers who are working to make their land more valuable and they know that the landlord won't raise the rents because they have some legal right to, 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 to protect uh, to protect themselves against rents being raised against their own improvements. Therefore, they feel secure investing. England is becoming much more productive agriculturally than the lands around it, and that's why we're so rich, and that's why we can send our ships out and conquer the rest of the world, the end. Um, it's an interesting story. It is the status of local people as voters, the decentralized democracy of England that he's saying is, is a large part of the wealth of England. The, what the English did send their boats around and managed to colonize and take control of India. Um, local autonomy without democracy exists in, the, in human history and, and, and it's often called feudalism. Uh, in early colonial India, uh, the British granted a local feudal powers to a group of, uh, the status of a group of people who were called Zamindars. Uh, these were given as property rights. They could, be, they could bequeath these powers to their heirs or sell them. They were, they, they were, uh, uh, they were basically the right to collect taxes and to, to be responsible for law and order in a collection of villages in rural India. The English did this, by the way, early in, in, the, in the colonial period, when, and then they did, reverted to doing it again after the 1857 mutiny. They, they understood that giving feudal power to created a class of local bosses 
who now had a vested interest in the British colonial regime and were a very effective way of controlling a country. They also understood when the English uh, power was better established, there was a reform movement and in large parts of India didn't have zamindars because the English understood they would get more productivity and ultimately more tax revenue if they'd give people, if they'd have a different kinds of political system, given, giving power to local panchayats, uh, local councils, or giving power to uh, bureaucracies that were, were based in the provincial council, in the provincial capitals, was better than creating a feudal layer. But when they wanted, when they were afraid of losing power in India, then they understood the power of feudalism. The effectiveness of this feudal power proved remarkably durable. Fifty or sixty years after independence, uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Lakshmi Iyer found in their study lower agricultural productivity and higher infant mortality in the in the parts of India that had where the British governed through feudal lords whose feudal powers since 1947 no longer existed, but, but whose residue uh, persisted. One has to ask how much of poverty in the world, of, global, of, of poor areas of the world, has resulted from such strategies of feudal state building by colonial or other traditional rulers. And this is why I feel the analysis of development is incomplete without a serious consideration of local politics. To give another example, in the 1700s in England, I want to say focus on, on what I think are unappreciated lessons from the British and American histories. Uh, in the 1700s, an institution in England called the Turnpike Trusts gave England the world's best transportation network. And this is what real, they, they developed, uh, they developed good, a system, good system of roads that had not existed anywhere else in the world before. Uh, the, the McAdams were in the business of building these roads, and the word McAdam tech is now associated with the technology they developed. Later on, under these turnpike trusts, road building technology became more standardized as, the, as new inventions for how to build durable paved roads were perfected, and it became possible to, to, to build roads anywhere in the world, but I want to argue the building of this road network depended critically on the structure of English government. Why? Because these, what these turnpike trusts were was they, they were local monopolists. They, 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 they were, the, there were toll roads, and there were gates, they were, and who ran them? The people who ran them were the local government. They were the county governments. Um, so the local, local leaders uh, in, different, in the various counties of England were given the rights to erect toll roads, to erect toll booths, if they would keep maintain better roads. Now, any economist can tell you that if every little bit of road you have a toll road, uh, the, 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 since people have to travel over many segments of road to get from one place to the other that they want to go to, there's an externality that the, 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 the high toll in one section reduces demand for other sections, and each, each section would like to have the highest rate. So you can't do this. So one of, one of the, by, by allowing people to collect tolls, they could raise the funds to maintain the roads, and they would have an incentive to make sure the road actually is, is passable, even in the rainy season. But if everybody has, you need a system of, of central regulation. If it's not regulated, then every, every section of the road wants to have a higher set toll than the next section, uh, and, and then no one will travel. So the toll roads had to be managed by the local govern governments, but they also needed to be regulated nationally. The national government's dependence on local elites in parliament meant that such local in investments could be nationally regulated and yet be secure against central expropriation. The fear is, once we build a nice section of paved road, now the national government will use its regulatory powers to, put, to centralize all, all, of the, all of the benefits of our local investment. Parliament made it possible to hold local leaders accountable to national law without threatening the system of local privileges because, of course, the parliament was a an assembly of representatives who had, were, were part of their local elites. 
So with representation in parliament also, English towns could become secure open markets uh, that, that, that attract investments. I, I mentioned uh, Poland and Spain as being country, Spain, well, let me just mention Poland in the, in, the, in the 1600s had a very strong system of a national assembly, but their cities were not represented. And I've argued elsewhere that uh, uh, their, the inability of Polish cities to build, a, secure, make themselves secure marketplaces had something to do with the fact that they had no power in the national system. Um, but, and, so, when I com contrast the, the, the toll, this toll road system that requires giving essential guarantees of property rights to local, gov local bosses in, in the different counties while maintaining a national regulation of that, of, of those local, you could look at, if you look in contrast at the failure to, to industrialize in late imperial Ch China, um, there's an excellent book by, by the, Chinese, well, the historian of China, um, uh, Albert Feuerwerker, uh, in 1958 that I want to recommend as a, as a detailed study of uh, the attempt to begin in, in China in, in, in the late Qing dynasty in, from 1860 until 1911 to try to develop, to respond to modern technology. And he, he contrasts the, uh, Japan as, as succeeding I, I don't know enough of the history of Thai response, but, the, but of course everybody in this part of the world was trying to respond to the new technology that, that, the, that the West had. And China, of course, was able to begin uh, developing companies that would have modern shipping, telegraphs, and railroads. These were sponsored by provincial governors in China. Each of these companies typically had a, a patron in the government at the provincial level. But the imperial government, at the, at the national level, couldn't restrain itself from expropriating their profits. In 1899, there was a famous trip by the Grand Secretary of, of the Imperial Government uh, where he went and, 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 and audited the, the, the accumulated profits the, 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 in, in the treasuries of all the various shipping corporations and, and, uh, and took it all to, uh, to, for, the, for the national treasury. Uh, the money he was taking was money being taken from co companies that were sponsored already by the government, but at lower levels, at the provincial government. Remember, the thesis is property is protected locally, but trade has to be protected nationally. It's, I think it's not often recognized what brought down the Qing dynasty in 1911. The answer is it was not a popular revolution. It was that the, the central government attempted to nationalize the railroads. In many countries, railroads are nationally run. They, have the same, they want to take people from one part of the nation to another, and it's, a, it's quite natural that national law should uh, control the rates and that the national government should have power over its railroads. But these railroads had been built, in, there were railroads in China in 1911, but they had all been sponsored by provincial governors. And the, when the central government nationalized the, rail, nationalized the railroads, the, the, the governors of the provinces lost confidence in, in the Qing dynasty. And that was what, what ended, that was the downfall of imperial China. Uh, Barry Weingast, writing about China, has given the phrase market-preserving federalism, that economic growth requires central leadership, that it that is strong enough to prevent local bosses from trying to make, to, to, to promote local monopolies, but weak enough that the central government cannot violate power sharing deals with local, local leaders. I think that the, the great prosperity in China today, the question is why has it been deferred? And I would like to suggest that in the, in the last 40 years, China has been blessed with a government that, is, that satisfies these two requirements. It is a strong government, but not too strong. Uh, having, a local, having a national leader who's very weak, obviously there's the, the, the period of warlords was a period of civil war and great suffering, but having a, a central leader who was too strong meant that, that, that uh, both in the imperial times and, and, and in other times under the communist leadership, there were periods when the central government was too strong and, uh, and, 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 and uh, that no, everyone knew that, that local profits might be expropriated by the center. There is a balance that between local power and national power, which has been solved in a certain way and is, a, is I think, an important part of, of the success of China today. I, in general, I'd say when we look at any country, a central question is how are governors chosen? Uh, central appointment, 
in it, a successful a government in any society to be successful needs to create a network of trust, of protection and trust that, that extends from the national leadership down ideally to, to, to every citizen in the country. Uh, our mayors and our governors are key links in that chain of trust. Um, and in any, as I look from one part of the world to another and try to understand, I think one of the key questions is, are the governors and mayors appointed by the central government or are they locally elected? Throughout the world, there has been a, a movement towards local election of, of governors and mayors. Uh, but it is, it, and, and this country is, is I think, has, has much, much election, but also a cent central appointment uh, is also a factor. There's a, a dual system. Um, there needs to be a balance. Both are needed. But what central, the more you have central appointment, it allows national leaders to use these offices as rewards for their central pol political supporters. But then you end up with governors and mayors who don't necessarily need local trust in order to, uh, to retain their offices. So centralization of the, of the profits of local government can weaken the state outside the capital. Robert Bates uh, has, a, has a good book about uh, uh, failures of African government where he, he outlines states that have, 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 I think, made this, have chosen this strategy and thereby impoverished their nation. The central government, the, the, the person in the presidential palace uses appointments to, of, to, to, of, of, of local governors as a, uh, as a patronage appointment, but then uh, loses the trust. Uh, the United States is trying to support in Afghanistan has a, a, a centralized presidential regime where governors are appointed by the president uh, by, of, of the elect who was, who was democratically elected, or at least was at least once democratically elected. Uh, um, the second election was, was somewhat tainted, perhaps, but, uh, but, but he controls, but the governor, although there are locally elected councils in, 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 in Afghanistan, uh, they don't control the governor. The governor is an appointee of the central government and in many places is, is, is seen to lack trust in ways of, with, with, with local elites in ways that make, leave an opening for, for the Taliban opposition. Um, so the alternative is, is some form of constitutional power sharing with autonomous local leaders, which could be decentralized democracy or feudalism. In a federal system, national leaders' reputations for respecting these local privileges become essential for building strong political co coalitions. I, wa I want to argue that democratic decentralization gives more people political standing to invest securely in the state, and that course is the point about Adam Smith's yeoman, that local government where, where, where local leaders are, ele are elected with, with democratically as opposed to being local feudal lords um, allows not just uh, corp local corporations to, to invest securely but also a much deeper level of investment down to the, the individual farmer feeling that it's safe to improve the quality of his fields and that he his, the value won't be, of his investment won't be stolen. Um, let me say, to say, just to carry forward the story of, 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 of from England to America, uh, in, it was really in the 19th century in England and, and a little bit earlier in America, uh, late 18th and 19th century, that rights to vote were extended from a small fraction of the population to, to to be to universal male suffrage and then uh, to, uh, and then to universal suffrage uh, in the early 20th century, uh, men and women, promises of when more people vote, politicians who are competing for votes begin to find that just promising to give away money becomes more expensive, and it's cheaper to 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 build public, to promise to provide good public goods, better roads and schools, uh, a, a, a better, a, a better enforcement of laws, public goods and services become a better water, water supply, become, should appeal to a large fraction of the vo of voters more effectively than promises of special favors. So an increase in the franchise may, theorist suggests, theory suggests, help to motivate the gov gov our politicians to, 
to make sure that, their gov that our governments provide us with the public goods we need, uh, transportation network, good clean water. But even with free elections, a corrupt leader can retain po power if voters believe that the, all the other candidates would be just as bad. So I've written a, a theoretical model in which I show how uh, you, have, can have you can have multiple equilibrium democracy, one where the voters expect their, their, can't, their leaders to do, provide good government, and, and therefore, and if anyone didn't, he, they, 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 the, the voters look for an alternative and vote for no, another candidate. But there's also an equilibrium where everyone thinks all of those candidates, all of our politicians are going to be very corrupt, and the one we have in power, uh, we know, we'll, we'll, let's stay with, with, with him or her because uh, who knows what the others would do. They, they talk well, but what, what would they really do? Successful democracy re requires more than just competitive elections. It requires a large supply of candidates with re who have reputations for pub using public goods, I'm sorry, for using public funds responsibly. Let me see the bold face here. I think that... In, Development economists, there's in, in development economics, there's a long tradition of saying we need to increase the national supply of something. What we need is to increase the national supply of steel mills for industrialization, or what we need is to increase the supply of human capital, of education. I want to suggest a different story, and, among, and, and, and of course all, all of these stories have some truth, but I want to add a different layer of the theory of, of development. And that is, we want to increase the national supply of po politicians who have good reputations for spending public money responsibly to provide public goods and services. A country where we don't have any politicians with such reputations is obviously a, a very unfortunate country. A country where we have a, where we have a leader who is doing a pretty good job is good, but in order to make sure the leader continues to do a good job, we need to know that there's somebody else who's not the leader, who also has done a good job. So we need a, a, an excess supply. We need the, the people in office to know that there's somebody else out of office who also has, has a history of spending public funds responsibly. That's an economist's view of the question of getting, making democratic elections genuinely competitive for what people really want, which is government that provides better public service. I've so far been talking about the relations between national and local government, and the connection I'm trying to make with this is that when we ask how could a nation increase its supply of politicians who have good reputations for using public resources responsibly, the answer, the best answer I can come up with, and this is a theorist, but I want, but I, but, but the question is, it, does this have real practical application? The best answer I can come up with is responsible local and provincial governments. Uh, when, 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 provi when municipal and provincial governments are locally elected and have real budgetary responsibility, then you're giving more local autonomous politicians an opportunity to begin developing the same reputations that you hope for from your national leadership but thereby you hope to make the national may hope to make the national government more competitive. Let me say, I, I claimed to, that I could give d evidence from, from English and American history. I think it's not sufficiently appreciated. In the history of the United States, the most important fact about the United States of America is that it was a revolution made by 13 separate colonies. When the revolution happened, there were many patriot, we now call them patriots because they won, who wanted to make the, uh, the, the new government. Uh, there were others who we call loyalists, who would have been the patriots if they, if they had won, who, who actually you know, wanted to, to stay attached to England. Uh, and uh, it's not, you know, however we write the history, both, side, the, both views were, were amply represented in the population. The people who made the revolution were the Rep members of the 13 provincial assemblies. It was a revolution by 13 provincial assemblies. The people in those provincial assemblies wanted a hundred, had a large part of the power of administering the colonies. The English government was, inter was interacting and, and taking away some of those powers for whatever reasons they thought were appropriate. And no, the, the, the provincial assembly said, no, we want 100% of the power and we're going to make a revolution to have it. 
So it was a revolution made by 13 provincial assemblies, which formed then above themselves a Congress, a national Congress. So the government started with two layers at least, and, and the members of the provincial assemblies, they were elected by single or two member districts. So they were typically representatives of, of local, the local leadership in the various towns and counties around the provinces. So the United States was founded with two or three levels of political leadership that, uh, which under, British, under the British imperial system, they had all had to stand for election. So the, the, there was a tradition of, of representative election and there was a tradition of decentralization of that level of, that ele of, of, the, of, of government right from the beginning of the United States. Since then, we've had um, uh, the, the, the central government has become much more powerful. The American Civil War in the 1860s was, was certainly an important step. The New Deal under Franklin Delano Roosevelt was another stage of the increase in the power of the central government. I want you to know as you look at America today and, and you read awful things about American politics and uh, that, that we, we have our political problems at least as much as any other country I know about, in some sense the Constitution was designed to create the kind of gridlock but the, between the Congress and, and, and the President uh, that, that has made it very difficult for the United States to, to, to make the hard decisions, hard fiscal decisions, and yet that gridlock that we wouldn't have if we had a parliamentary system, if we had a unicameral parliamentary government, you wouldn't have the kind of breakdown of, of the inability of the central government to function, has probably been responsible for making sure that the central government didn't overwhelm the, set, the 50 separate states. And so the, the, the balance of power between the central, the, na the national government and the state governments or provincial governments uh, that exists in the United States, maybe it owes something to the potential for gridlock that we're suffering. But what I really want to say is that the federal democracy meant that the United States from the very beginning was indeed rich in leaders who had reputations for using public resources responsibly, uh, for, uh, for, for, yes, using public resources responsibly for providing public services so that uh, we did have, uh, un under an early president, uh, there was a, 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 there was a attempt to, uh, uh, to, to ban political dissent. There was a, uh, I forgot what, the, what it was called, but under John Adams, uh, there were laws that were restricting freedom of speech, freedom to criticize the central government. And when those were done, um, this, the separate states objected. And there was no way that the central government could overwhelm the separate states because people trusted their, their, their provincial politicians as much as they, more than they trusted national for much of the, the history. So the argument I'm trying to make, in, in summary of the second part, is that we might be, seek better candidates for national, whenever people argue about, about the, the appropriate devolution of power from central to provincial and municipal levels. There's a question of, for whatever value of our, uh, whatever we, however we measure the welfare of our countries, uh, we need we need a lot. We need our central governments to have the power to provide some important services to our country. We also need local government to be able to provide some powers. What's the optimal level of devolution of power to, to decentralization of power? One thing I would argue before saying anything else is that um, whenever you're in charge at the central level, whoever gets power at the national level. All has some vested interest in less decentralization. They would rather uh, um, retain the rights to, to the patronage rights of those appointments to the valuable positions uh, as rewards for their supporters. So probably decentralization in most countries is not over provided. Uh, the history of the United States means, I've argued, that it began with less of that, with maybe, maybe the United States was too decentralized at the beginning because it, uh, it started from 13 separate colonies. But in most cases, we probably have, if anything, too little decentralization. But what, to appreciate the advantages of decentralization, most theorists have focused on do, central, do, do, 
do local governments, local governments better understand what local people want and they, are they more accountable to local voters? Both may be true. There is no question, however, that when a country chooses to, de to devolve more power to its local provincial councils, that we will then see an increase in the amount of corruption by local provincial councils. This, you know, we're not, I, I, I don't want to suggest that, that we should expect any one particular layer of government to be more trustworthy than any other layer of government. We, we should worry about our corruption in our national governments and in our municipal governments and in our provincial governments. Um, what I do want to argue that I think has not been sufficiently appreciated is that when provincial leaders in a world where there is provincial corruption, when, provincial when a particular group in a particular province, the, the leadership of that province is less corrupt than expected, they then get a reward that, uh, uh, that they can rise to national power but they also enrich national politics by providing a source of people who have surprised us, who have developed better reputations than we expected. So I want to argue that the performance of democracy in general depends critically on interactions between the different levels of local and national politics. Democracy at higher levels becomes more competitive when challengers can show records of good public service at lower levels. That's the extra benefit that I think has been underappreciated. And the question I would ask is, in, in, in Thai politics, I don't know to what extent have there been serious contenders for national leadership who first developed their reputations by doing good, by providing good public service at the local level. The President of the United States was challenged in the recent election by Mitt Romney, uh, and the President, Barack Obama, we'd seen what he did for four years, but Mitt Romney wasn't coming from nowhere. He was someone who had been the governor of Massachusetts, a, a large state. He spent a large public budget there, and uh, it's, a, it's considered that he did a pretty good job as governor of Massachusetts. So we got better candidates. Whichever candidate you preferred in America, you were getting a better, a better choice because you knew that... Uh, that, that uh, uh, the president knew that he had, would have to run against someone who might have had good uh, credentials from outside. Um, the possibility of democratic advancement, and that's an important word, to higher offices can give officials more incentive to provide good public services. As I look at China today, they have, now have uh, serious competitive elections at the very lowest level of, of, of village or, 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 or local district in, in, uh, uh, in a neighborhood in, in the city. Um, but I would argue that maybe to have what I would call true competitive democracy, it's, it's, it's necessary to have at least two levels. If they have township and county level, then you have in the township, you have local officials who, if they can do a better job, might hope to get advanced up to county level. In every business, especially in politics, advancement, promotion to a higher level is important. If democracy denotes any system in which leaders get greater responsibility when they earn trust and approval from more citizens. But in any system, the, the boss, an important uh, power of the boss is the power to promote from a lower level to a higher job, which has more rewards and more resources associated with it. Um, if the voters are the bosses in a democracy, the power to promote from a lower level to a higher level is an important power that we want to have. But conversely, local co democracy becomes more competitive when different groups in the National Assembly can sponsor alternative local candidates. Uh, the data on devolution of power to uh, countries which have had more or less uh, devolution of power to locally elected councils is very ambiguous. I can't claim that there's been there's clear evidence proving the devolution of power uh, um, uh, it causes rise in GDP. Uh, if it would, it's going to be a long, slow process because it's through, I'm arguing through the interaction with the lifetime career reputations of, of, of politicians. But I can say that I think there is some evidence that um, local democracy functions better in countries that already have a competitive, have multiple parties with competing at the national level. 
but certainly I think that's an important part. So let me conclude by saying I think the value of federal democracy, federal meaning at national and local level, provincial and local levels, um, I think it's been manifested in the history of the United States. Perhaps part of my point of my talk was to suggest a theoretical perspective I'm trying to understand uh, this un an un unappreciated aspect of, of, of um, what enabled America to be as, as, as developed, to be as strong as it did. But on the other hand, although it's manifested in the history of the United States, it's not always been manifested in American policy. I've mentioned, and I do want to end with this contrast, uh, that the United States in its policies of, of promoting a centralized presidential re regime in Afghanistan was failing to appreciate part of the lessons of its own history, uh, the importance of, 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 of decentralized uh, uh, democratic power as well as un national elections. So thank you. Let me pause end there and say that I look forward to any discussion we can have. Thank you. Um, if, if any participants here at UTCC, or um, let me tell you also that we have live broadcast this event to um, Burma. Um, if any participant would like to ask any question or share any ideas or experiences, um, you can come to the central microphone or if it's not convenient, raise your hand and our staff will bring the microphone to you. Please. Yes. Yeah, um, um, the one who would like to um, make a comment, please yes, introduce yourself to oh, the audience. Okay. My name is Poom Jai Naksgun. Head researcher at the Bank of Thailand. Um, at the risk of oversimplification, I think what I've gathered from from your talk is perhaps that the, the old federalism debate yes. shouldn't be so much a debate as a matter of balance, so yes. that you have a good quality local autonomy respected by a national a federal state. Yes. And I think I think the argument you, you're saying is that the quality of governance which is probably better proven at the local level can then percolate upward and then you get better quality at the national level. But I was wondering what if it's, and this is a skeptical point of view, is that what if it's the other way around? Mm -hmm. What if the quid pro quo sort of corrupted um, system at the national level actually becomes oh. institutionalized downward so the, so the direction of this cozy government relationship, you know, that, that yeah. has always existed perhaps in, in Thailand at the higher national politics then become institutionalized yes. at the provincial level. So this is quite contrary because, because in Thailand, I mean, I do agree that uh, any form of local government, you get a lot better transparency, but it's also possible perhaps due to some monitoring costs or something that yeah in maybe in Thailand, once you get beyond very small provincial or cooperative states, then you can't really monitor your, your, your politician that well. So, so, so the risk is not that you get the quality of, of governance percolating upward, you get the corruption uh, going downstream. So certainly, there's, well, in, there, there's an argument that, that, that's often made, and you've, you've, you've made it, that, 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 that it's easier for us voters to monitor local performance, and therefore we're going to get better quality government locally. I think, for example, in the United States, in the history of the United States, I think typically voters have had, in, in the, certainly the tw in, in my lifetime, uh, I, I, have the, I would qualitatively, I think voters have trusted the national government much more than their, lo than their state governments. I think, uh, um, we're, so I, 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 I would not make the thesis that, uh, Local government is more is going to be less corrupt than the national government. And in fact, but but that's uh, but it could. Uh, but I, but to say there, there are fundamental reasons to hope for that. You, you were making a very interesting argument that, that says supposing we had local governments. That, well, let me back up and say. Here I want I tried to argue this 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 bullet point right here, is saying that that 
there is a very natural, uh, I'm from Chicago where we have a one party system. I mean, the, you know, the, in the city of Chicago, you, you don't get elected unless you're a Democrat. Um, but I think we have, uh, I kind of like, I, I think we've had effective government by our mayors uh, in recent years and in, in, in my, my ex and, and I think I would credit that even though it's a one party state that, that, that uh, if the, uh, if the corruption of, 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 of City Hall were so bad that, that it was not actually generating the, the services that people felt they needed, uh, there was no way to prevent the Republican Party, amazingly, uh, they, would, they would be able to come in and the Republicans would be able to come in and nominate a challenger and, and there's no way for the, for the Democrats to prevent the Republican votes from being counted uh, because there is a multi-party national arena. So, so, I, so I would argue that, that the, polit the dem local politics often becomes dominated by local bosses. Certainly, American history supports that. Uh, a, lot, a lot of cities have had local bosses, not just Chicago. But uh, national de competition forces a certain, um, uh, and for instance, the history, the, 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 the recent history, the Bolivian reforms that I've just read about, the, 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 uh, the 1990s Bolivia, which was one of the worst governed countries in, 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 in Latin America, uh, introduced local democracy reforms and a number of case studies, local bosses, initially local elites established themselves as bosses, but then the other, other they could only be associated with one national party, and the other, and the other national party then came in and recruited uh, challengers, and, uh, and, and ultimately uh, people, competition forced a certain improvement in government. You suggested a very interesting thesis. We could have a community where they, they would they would not have had cor much corruption, but corrupt national parties come in and force themselves on, on and that would that certainly is 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 something we should worry about. Uh, how do we how could we reduce the chance of that? I think part of it is is if is when is is that when the when is is, is precisely if it's not national administration we could certainly. Ha if, if we have a unitary state where everything is controlled for the center, one can imagine a community where within the community themselves they could handle their, their public roads and schools well, but, but then the national leadership, they have two, choice of two national parties, either one of which is going to send in administrators who will really take most of the money and, and, and give it to favorites. The, the diff difficulty with that, with, once this local election, one of the things, if I'm in a corrupt party, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a career politician and I belong to a party, uh, do, how much less corrupt do I want to be than they are? Well, maybe, maybe I, don't want to, I don't want to be le much less corrupt than the national leadership of my party because, I, because otherwise I become a threat to other members of my party and then I'm not going to be pop, advance, get advancement. But if, my, if, I, my, if I have the right to be re-elected by my, the voters of my district, then it might be better for me to, to go against the cor general corruption of my party and provide better services. Because, so it's important. So I think when a member of a, of, of a call it corrupt party, is, is, is the locally elected leader and has the ability to say, you know, I'm, if, I'm gonna, I could stand for re-election without, and, and give up my party affiliation. I could jump to a different party and the citizens in this area know and trust me then that becomes a more valuable asset. So in that sense, I'm not afraid of, of, of a, well, I, I've suggested the value of local democracy being embedded in national politics, uh, in a national political system, not being separate from it. Uh, and I think the advantages are probably greater than the disadvantages. And I think you asked, raised a very interesting possibility of a disadvantage. But I would, I, my answer is I would not worry too much about it because the ability of the local candidate to run for re-election without his party's sponsorship, if he becomes too, too clean, if he becomes too good, uh, if he gen genuinely makes him popular, himself popular with the voters, he can run for re-election on that basis. It, that breaks down if there is lack of transparency in the sharing of funds from the national government to the local government. Then they say, you have to elect one of our corrupt cabal or you won't get any central funds. That becomes a problem. So one of the dual sides of democratic decentralization is some transparency in the 
fiscal relationship between the national and, and, and provincial governments. Uh, question? Yeah, please. Thank you for your very interesting um, argument, Professor. Um, you, you seem to suggest otherwise, but from your um, idea about um, the agency rent, make me, make me believe that um, the national government, the federal government, will somehow be more corrupted than the local government. Firstly, um, as, the, uh, as we have discussed before, in the local government, it, it, is, uh, more, it is easier uh, to make the politicians accountable to the people because cause of monitoring and yes. that sort of thing. And also your idea about um, the agency rent means that um, a local government that can perform well by providing enough public services can be elected and create reputation to a higher level. And by um, being promoted to a high level, which is the national level, yeah. he can gain more agency yes. rents. Right. Exactly. Um, which but means- But bid, bid down the price of the agency rents because he's gonna compete by saying, I'll do it for less. Exactly. Yeah. But once he becomes the national leader, he, become more, he has a tendency to become more corrupted because yes. there is no higher agency rents. There may be a second term, yes. but then at the end of the term, yes. that's the end of the game. Yes. So people think um, induction backward right. and then become corrupted. Absolutely. And it's, it's more difficult to monitor politicians at the national level. Yes. So my question is, in this um, point of view, yes. how can we prevent or reduce corruption at the national level? Yes. I offer uh, a few solutions. Firstly, um, to offset for the um, opportunity cost of corruption, you have to um, offer really attractive salary, which may be the case of Singapore. Mm -hmm. They have a um, very handsome um, salary for government officials at a high level. Secondly, use the China option. Um, the China option is that they compete fiercely to go to the, the, uh, the, uh, the top of the echelon, as in the case of, you know, they are conducting the national um, assembly at the moment. The ones who appear to be performing really well and being clean are promoted. Yeah. The ones who are considered as corrupted as, for example, Bo Si Lai are dumped. Yes. But once they become the national leader, you hear news from the New York Times, people like Wen Jiebao also concealed huge amount of money in terms of his uh, mother salary, mother, you know, shareholding, that sort of thing. So the the, China op the, the Chinese solution, which I believe also may be perhaps the same as the U.S. solution, is that you have clean local government, but then once they are promoted to be okay. national leader, they are corrupted. But uh, decentralization goes far, far well enough so that the national level government cannot expropriate from the welfare of the uh, local people. That results in certain kinds of equilibrium. The third solution may be um, it is not enough to have only election, as you seem to suggest, but we need to also have other types of mechanisms, for example, um, transparency, strong yes. media, strong judiciary, that sort of thing, other check and balance. I would like to hear your response. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think no, you're absolutely uh, the, the concept of agency rent was, was, a, was I was bolding it because I want to suggest that uh, where there is great opportunity to abuse power, we should not expect to abolish uh, s significant rewards, even if these people are no better than the rest of us. Uh, um, I like the. I didn't. I don't know about the salary structure in in Singapore government, but I I agree. I think, for example. Uh, representatives and senators in the United States Congress should be paid much, much more money uh, and we would have higher quality, uh, a higher quality legislature if we would pay them, uh, start, start the representatives at, at half a million dollars and the, and, the, and, the, and the senators at a million dollars, let's say. It's, it, it, it's ridiculous. Uh, a, a you know, serious, for example, a senior lawyer uh, doesn't want to 
be in the, in the United States Congress, unless, unless he's going to make a money on corruption, because he's much better off uh, being a, uh, a successful attorney and, and than being an a, a, a elected member of Congress. Um, I think the deep, you're, 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 you've given a very good critique of, of, of my hope that, that, that it, by proving their abilities at lower levels, that, but we should, we should work backwards and say, ah, but when they get to the top, they will turn bad. Um, and that's a, a very realistic question. Uh, I think the ultimate answer that maybe does, and, and, uh, 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 is um, what we're hoping, that, that, say, that the, the structure of opportunities means there are going to be some inevitable agency rents, but we want them to be the minimal agency rents that we can have consistent with the, the government providing good service, providing the services but the government having the funds to provide the services. Um, and ultimately, uh, the ultimate hope for that is that if, when the, if, 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 if we haven't reached that, that least cost of, of, of government, that the other party has an incentive to come in and bid for less. Uh, how do they make a, a, a commitment to actually uh, keep that? Uh, part of the answer is de developing a reputation that, that, that they can then, that, uh, so that uh, if we have competition, and not just among people, but among organized factions that are parties, then, uh, and we have to have real, and we're going to have new elections, then um, if one party has, if one party has fought its way in based on something, some credibility of a promise to do better, but then failed to do better, they, they should expect to be one term, and then the voters to return to the other. Slightly, slightly let you know. Let, uh, the, the, the old party will come back. Whereas, if you if you hope to establish that you can do better, that you will be real, that your party will be reelected uh, again. But that requires a, a bias towards, at some point, turning out the party that does only just as well as the last one. They promise to do better. How can we hope to get that? Uh, I think ultimately. There's a question of information, and in that sense, I'm thinking of a model where there are different types, and how do we identify who are the types who are more able to provide an efficient government? My only hope was uh, to give them more opportunities, and then and, and that, that led me to think about local government. But you're absolutely right, it, 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 it's, it can't be a logical panacea, it can't, it can't solve, uh, th th there's always the possibility that we'll get stuck in an equilibrium where everyone expects that, the, oh, they'll pretend to be good at the local level, but when they get to the national level, then they'll turn bad. As long as they're pretending to be good at the local level, at least we're getting good local government. I have, that, that was the point of the logical paper where I worked out all the details. I, was able to, I wasn't able to prove we would get good government at the national level or at the provincial level, but I could prove that you couldn't get bad government consistently at both. Because if you did, that, and if you, there was any possibility of somebody who was just a better leader, then the, the, the one that who, who could look like he was just a better leader at the, na at the local level would then be promoted to the national level, but then all the governors would do it. So, uh, so either you could get competitive democracy at the lower level. So that, that was the best I could do in a logical argument. Let me finally say about promotion in China. I, I think that, that China, has obviously grown phenomenally well. Of course, the people are saving a great deal also, and so the return on investment might not be as good as it, but, but there's no question that, that the government of China, uh, the governing elite, or the ruling party in China has delivered a growth that is a, one of the most important events in human history, and the Chinese people should be grateful to their, their, their ruling party for, uh, for, for very successful development. Uh, and part, and I'm trying to understand how it works so well. I'm, I'm trying to understand how any system works well, and you've, you've argued that even democracy isn't necessarily, it's hard to understand how democracy can work as well as we hope it would. Um, but, a, a, and it sounds like a very good principle, a non-competitive state where we're going to promote people to national leadership only after they've done a good job of administering at lower levels. The problem with that is that the guys who are responsible at the top level are trying, the factions at the national leadership, 
there's a lot of secretiveness, so none of us outside of who, if we're not members of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, it's very difficult to understand how politics works there. But it's got to work according to some principles that are common to all the rest of humanity, uh, because there are people like the rest of us. And I think they have, it is certainly understandable that there are different factions and different leaders. And what the different factions are trying to do is get a reputation for reliably rewarding ser political service. Not service in building our country, but political service, loyalty. So do I reward you and promote th those among you if I'm the, uh, uh, if I'm a, if we're, if we're a ruling party in a country and I'm one of the leaders of one of the important factions, I would like, I would always like to kind of move things towards those that I, I will use my power of promotion to promote you, not for building the country, but for being loyally serving me and my career. And so what prevent, what keeps the standards of promotion based on, yes, you've been, you've, you've loyally served me, but you did a bad job of, of growing the economy or of, of providing better roads and schools to the people in the district. How do we keep them focused on service? In 1989, there was a very serious challenge to political, there was, there was a serious political challenge to the authority of the Communist Party. I think the Communist Party in China has done a very good job of, of, of governing their country, but I think they're doing a better job. Th their, their ability to fight off becoming a, a, a privileged oligarchy where the, 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 the highest level promotes based on um, loyalty rather than based on service depended, I think, on something of a political challenge. I think it's difficult, it, it, and, and I think that's a, a question that needs to be asked, how to maintain the organizational incentive to keep promoting based on public service. But as I try to understand, I'm an American, and Americans believe in democracy. I think people in Thailand from, have a different history, but a, but a, a similar deep faith in, 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 this, in this same idea. It's an important idea to both of us. There are other countries that are not democratic and have virtues, but I think the principle that leaders should get greater responsibility when they earn trust and approval of citizens, of more citizens, is I think shared by the, I think the Communist Party of China wants to uh, promote leaders who, uh, they, they, but it's because they understand that they need to do so to retain their, their privileged political position. And if it, that privileged political position was unchallenged for generations, I think they would have a very difficult time not becoming a, a group that promotes based on loyalty rather than on service. Uh, it's not enough to have ideological training. I think there has to be some uh, something, some mechanism that I would call democracy, but might not look at all like uh, uh, American democracy. Sorry. One more question. Uh, now. Uh, Thai government is pushing towards more and more local elections, such as the small, small towns to become a municipality. municipality. Yeah. And uh, they are also passed by, the, by the, the, the government, and this is in the parliament. And there's an argument from the political scientists that there must be some criteria, such as the size, the money that can be raised, the knowledgeability of the people who come to represent the local government. The question is this, what is your criteria with the requirement for the local democracy, local administration to be established, the criteria. Uh, and, and, no. and another is that uh, the cooperation between the central government and the decentralized governments, such as when the disaster, such as the flood, comes. Uh, oh. Disaster, such as when the flood comes. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, how, how can we cooperate that? In, let me say about disaster earlier. The, the, um, one important 
country to talk about uh, I should, is Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan has, has three times had major devolution of power to locally elected councils at the, at the, munici at the small district and, and municipal levels. Uh, uh, and three times they've been undone. Each time it's been military dictators who created local democracy. When national and provincial democracy was restored, Pakistan is a country with only four provinces. So there are two levels of... In, each time when civilian politicians retain, re, were, were stored in power at the national and provincial levels, the, they got rid of the, the local democracy. This happened most recently. Uh, Musharraf uh, gave power back to, to, for local elections. The PPP government was installed in, in 2008. And in summer of 2009, uh, they dissolved the, the local elected councils that, that General Musharraf had created under military rule. Uh, in January of 2010, there was serious flooding in the Indus River. Uh, and uh, there has been, I don't believe will be, any study of this. But uh, we can only wonder to what extent the restoration of centrally appointed district magistrates to have responsibility to the government and the dissolution of those locally elected councils uh, must have in some places hindered the, the disaster relief. That is to say, there may have been, the, the, the local councils were at the level of the average local unit was of, of about 25,000 people in the, in the smallest level of government in, in the Musharraf, the, what they call a union, a union level of government under Mushar, General Musharraf. Uh, under Pakistan today, uh, there are only two levels of election, members of the provincial assembly and members of the national assembly. These are districts of the order of half, half a million people in each district approximately. So a community of 10,000 uh, would have been a big deal, would have been to, to some local official at, under the old system, the one that was dissolved in, to, in January, 2000, in, in the summer of 2009, and I fear that there were some communities that simply got lost because they weren't important enough to the, they didn't have enough political voice. So obviously disaster relief is an important, you know, it requires coordination of many different groups. Uh, but the fear that there will be communities that, 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 that are suffering and don't have enough political voice to make sure that the, I'm back, I'm back up and say, uh, uh, one of the int very interesting observations, by, uh, profound observations by Amartya Sen is the question of that does, do uh, um, famines only never happen in, have, under democracies? That, 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 that when, when mass uh, parts of the population have starved to death, they were people who weren't voters. No government would tolerate voters starving. Uh, though that a disaster is, is, is you know, is, 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 is you know, the, the, the famine is the, is, 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 is the worst of disasters, but, but a flooding disaster is what, where we get relief. We need to make sure that we're getting public resources out to everybody. Are there going to be, how many people can be, well, one person might be overlooked. I thought, would a thousand people be overlooked? Would 10,000 people be overlooked? Well, it depends on how important their political voice is, and I think a political, a decentralized political system should have at least as much hope of, of, and I would argue that there's some reason to fear that in this specific instance, a political recentralization may have caused the, 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 the mortality in, in, in the Indus flooding of, of January 2010 to be greater than it might have been otherwise. Um, you had just something else. I yeah, think uh, I what, what is, what is oh. needed for a local administration yeah. to be established? Let me say. It's needed. The, the, the short answer is, the, 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 of course, it's complicated. What public services do we want and what communities? I think the perspective, I want to simply add a different level to it. And, and one thing that I would argue should be a criterion is that we'd like, just which is only one part of what government is about, but, uh, but devolution of, when devolution of power creates a ladder of offices. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you have devolution of power to c local councils that, that represent about 25,000 people each, and then you have 60 million people in your country, uh, well, somebody who does a good job of running a, a village 
you know, a, a, a local council with 25,000 citizens is not thereby established as a, good, as a credible contender for prime minister. It's just a different, it's too different. So there's something to be said for somewhere between 20 and 100 units within each level. Now Singapore is a small country, but the same argument would apply that, that Singapore having, you know, having multiple levels of government, it providing a level of, 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 of you know, it, uh, Russia is a very large country, and, 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 it's, and, and the United States is very large. Thailand is smaller, but my argument is sort of independent of those, that a, a country should be divided into somewhere between uh, 20 and 100 provinces, each of whose governors could be then a credible contender for national power, and then each of these provinces divided into somewhere between 20 and 100 sub-districts. Now, that's, that has nothing to do with the geography and the natural unit that a, a city, for example, with, with 10 million people in it, because of its people are draw, because of com commuting across the city is a natural unit of where you want governance for the entire city uh, to be the most important level. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously geography matters, and, 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 uh, but I would like to add to that the idea that one hopes for multiple levels of government where the ratio of size is such that, uh, that we create a ladder of democratic advancement as being one of the advantages of, the stru of, of a structure of government that should not be overlooked. Question, yeah. Thank you, Professor Madsen, for a very inspiring lecture. It's a very touching topic, and especially in Asia. <clears throat> Probably your model works on two tenants. One is the agency rent yes. and the democratic advancement. Uh, I wonder whether this is model is uh, only applicable in a society like in the United States of America, or is it a global model? Because what we see in Asia, basically, the democratic advancement in certain form is there. And third one, you mentioned the gridlock between the state and the federal government. If it is a parliamentary democracy, yeah. that will be less. Yes. But contrary to this, what we see the evidence here, like take a case of India. We have a federal government, we have more than 29 states, and we see frequent gridlocks between two. Yes. The another problem which happens with this model is what I believe looking at your lecture, that it depends on the advanced civil societies when the information dissymmetry is less and the people make a rational and reasoned choices to elect their leaders. That is probably the basic tenet of this model. What happened in Asia at large, and particularly I give you an example in India, where even the prime ministers are imposed, they have not done any work in their lifetime. Even the prime minister who are put in the country, they have not done any work at lower level in their lifetime. That's a very unique case. In India, yes. So in India, what happens the federal government, they corrupt leaders, they collude with the local leadership, and they promote those leaders which are, again, similar problem of China and India, that they are loyal to them rather than on any performance basis. So how this model then the agency read, because they don't have the incentive as an agency rent, they have the incentive of the loyalty and get more corruption. Yes, sir. So this is the problem of the uh, democratic governance in Asian region. It's to a certain extent present in every country, wherever somewhere large, somewhere less. This is one. Yes. And the democratic advance does not go from the bottom to up, rather sometimes go up to down. So these are the two issues. Does it incorporate it in your model? Just, uh, is it true that, that that no prime minister of India has, no, has, I didn't has say ever no. served as a, as a no, party chief? No, I didn't say no. Some that. of the cases, yeah. Yeah. he hasn't served anywhere and he was directly put as the prime minister yeah. because he comes from a family oh, no, 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 no. which rules the country for a long time. In, yes, the, the, so the, the, if strictly I apply this model, it really doesn't get any support in that. I, I, I'm sorry. The, so the thesis was... Yeah. We're introducing, not that all people, all national politicians should rise up, and the, yeah. uh, but what I, one thing I, so certainly from American history, we have had presidents who were generals first, presidents who, who were serving in the Senate first, uh, but we've had, and then we've had governors come in. So it, it, the addition of a, an alternative channel helps to 
break down, has to, helps to reduce the possibility that the different factions in the national capital all collude for their mutual benefit and we say, oh, we'll overlook your corruption. If you'll overlook our corruption, then we'll just take turns and we'll have these ideological differences that keep, keep half of the electorate voting for one and half the other, but really we'll just chair the power back and forth. Um, uh, that's the threat that I'm trying to, to and, and to me, I think in, in American history, part of what has helped to overturn, to, to limit that effect, has been the possibility of a governor promoting himself separately. He's a member of one of the parties, but he develops a reputation, and he, partly he, he uses that reputation to guarantee he'll be reelected as governor, make it more likely he'll serve again as governor, but then he, when he gets a chance, he, he comes up and thereby enriches national politics. I, I believe there have been Indian prime ministers who had previously served as, as, as chief ministers of a province, but I, I, I can't say a name, so I don't know. Uh, the, if there are any, that would be, that would be ev the evidence, of, not that all. Uh, on the other side, um, let me say, what are, I'm sorry. No, no, the yeah. key question yeah. was, this model provide a good uh, basis if you apply like US yeah. history, yeah. it's fine. I have not seen in the history yeah, what I yeah. know about America. Yeah. Any Israel. president has been appointed without any uh, so experience as a governor. I certainly don't want to come to Asia and say this is yeah. this is great about America, but not. No, it's it's that it's a universe. It's a log. I'm, I'm thinking about. I'm looking for logical structures yeah. that can can provide an incentive for our leaders to do even better, uh, uh, and uh, and I'm looking for some evidence in history. Uh, so I. I it's only because I can see a logical analysis that I want to observe this aspect of American history that I think, and, and English uh, political history that I think has been underappreciated as people ask, what's the secret of, of their success? Uh, what, made, what enabled them to become so powerful? Uh, and I think that this, the, the, the being rich in, uh, uh, in, in people with, in, in political, in, in serious political alternatives uh, enabled, uh, people in America to, to demand that much more of their, of their leaders. Not that our politics has achieved any sort of ideal, uh, but it's been better than it would have been otherwise. Uh, it's only because I, it seems like a logical, uni based on a sort of universal aspect of competing for power, I think if people ask, the most important aspect of any culture, or our cultures have many important aspects, but I want to argue perhaps the most important aspect of our culture in any society is what, what do we think makes a leader and what do we demand of our leaders? What, 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 could, what do our leaders have to do in order for us, us to, to continue to respect their position? Because by the way, the only reason they're a leader is because it's in, in game theory terms, it's a coordination game and we all have, uh, we all have to agree. And if we don't agree that, that you're our leader, then you aren't. Uh, so what, uh, what makes us think that you're our leader, and what could you do that would cost you that, that uh, recognition? Um, so what do we demand of our leaders? In some sense, I want to argue, when there is multi-party political competition, parties, different factions, get in the business of trying to educate the voters, you should de you're not demanding enough of those guys. You you should demand more and will give it. Well, of course, sometimes they do that and then don't give it. But, uh, and if voters don't expect much, then, they're not, then democracy is not going to enable them to get much. And, uh, and maybe that, maybe, I'm, you know, I can't stand up and say democracy is a guarantee of good, good governance. Um, I can only, because certainly, uh, I can only ask, how can we design the rules of the game of the politicians have to play to achieve power to try to achieve, to increase the probability that we'll get good governance? Um, uh, and, uh, but ultimately, it requires us to ask more of our, to find out, to try to identify how much can we ask of our elected leaders, and then to demand that, that our leaders provide it or else they don't, they will lose the recognition. For that, we, and, and my argument was only that 
devolution of some devolution of power gives more opportunities for leaders to teach us that we can demand more of them. But clearly, to prevent conflict between political adversaries who control the national and local levels from, from causing tearing the government against itself, we need clear, a clear boundaries of what each level of government does. And I've said nothing in this theory about what powers are better for national government, what powers are better for local government. I've really tried to argue only that having multiple levels, each of which has budgetary responsibilities that are commensurate with uh, being at this stage of the ladder of democratic advancement are important. Because I guess I'm assuming there's a generalized skill that I'm, if, if you elect me, I'm going to give jobs to my, my, my people. My, I'm, I'm going to give a lot of jobs to my cronies. But I am better than the other guy at demanding that my cronies actually provide some public services. And therefore, you should elect me. That's the case that I'm hoping our politicians would have an incentive to give. And anything we could do to design a system so they would do that, that would be better. Okay, one, one last thank question. You very much, yes. Sorry, I, I forgot like to introduce myself. My name is Sarawat, and I run a consulting company here. Thank you. I, I'd like to make just a Please. quick observation uh, here. Christopher Moore is my name. And it's a very interesting thesis you have about uh, really enhancement of legitimacy of how you create a more legitimate political class. And that, that's interesting. To, have a kind of an apprenticeship at the provincial level, and as legitimacy is established there, that becomes a credential at a national level. I can understand that. I think one part that seems uh, a bit incomplete in the theory it has to do with the role of security forces, uh, law enforcement, and the judiciary. For example, in Illinois, you will have uh, local judges that are elected. Uh, you will have uh, city police in Chicago, which have their own administration, where if you take the UK or you take Thailand, where you have a centralized police force, a centralized judicial system, does that fit into uh, the matrix that you're discussing at a local and provincial level, where in an American system, there is more control over the administration of justice from a law enforcement point of view and from a judicial point of view? I, it's clear that the, 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 the in local the law, local law enforcement there, as you say, there are countries that have decentralized police forces. Others where 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 where, where it's central, politically centralized. I I think, by the way, I think the, the, probably the m most disastrous decision that was made by the, the NATO NATO mentors of the of the new government in Afghanistan was to promote a a national police force. There are countries that have national police forces. But in a country, they require enormous uh, bureaucratic control. Police, our police have enormous power, and they need to be regulated. So a lot of paperwork is needed if you're going to do if the if if the only political accountability is that is in the national capital, and in a country with 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 as as low literacy rates as as Afghanistan has, it it was a disastrous decision, I think. Uh, that, let, that, that was probably more responsible to losing the countryside to the Taliban than anything else. If local elites had been who could have dominated local government, would have then con had political authority over their own local police forces. They could have organized to protect themselves against uh, when the Taliban were first coming back. Um, so I think, in general, uh, allowing some, I, I, I think, uh, uh, what. Limited experience I have makes me think that local policing being under control of local local elected councils is a good general principle. Although there certainly are exceptions, I think they are in countries where which have uh, very good educated bureau, you know, widespread people with enough edu widespread education with enough. Uh, so that your your police can be highly educated people who know how to fill out paperwork, uh, so that they can be accountable at, uh, to, to, at the higher level. Um, I have to tell you, I'm very aware that the history of uh, 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 of 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 the English judicial system was that it was 
national regulation of 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 of, of a judi local ju a local judiciary. I'm, 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 in some sense, as a theorist, I'm too embedded in history. Uh, the justices of the peace are the lowest level of English uh, uh, judicial system traditionally were, uh, I'm talking 1600, 1700s, were local gentry, but they were regulated by the national level. So again, it was a, uh, a relationship between national and local elites that was, was important. Um, I think ultimately, uh, our, we, the role of our judiciary in, in a successful society is a very interesting one. As a th fundamental theorist, I have to I marvel at the idea of, 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 of giving some power to this unelected group. In, in, in Illinois, as you've observed, I live in a state, it may not be known to everyone, I live in a state where we elect our judges, and uh, I'm not sure we get better judges as a result of that. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a question. Uh, my wife and I work very hard to try to figure out who are the judges we should vote for, but if you have voted in Illinois, you spend a lot of time voting for names you don't know what they are, um, and, uh, and, I, and they're going to stand up in, in courtrooms. Um, we create this system. It's a mir Let me just end on this. this uh, 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 on this, it's a, a system of people who uh, don't who are meant to have very flat incentives. A judge is going to be a respected person, but isn't accountable to anybody. Uh, and I think, what do we do with judges? I think the most important thing, they do many things in our societies, but the most important thing that, that, that they do, the, the, the right of habeas corpus in, in English common law, was that before the government does something nasty to you, uh, before the government does something nasty for me for breaking the law, they have to at least run it, they have to explain why they're doing it and throwing me in this jail to a judge. And the judge is a completely disinterested person and, and he has to have the information. Uh, that's an important right, uh, to have somebody who is a, is a privileged position in the government who simply has to be monitoring uh, the use of the state force against its citizens is an important question, of, uh, is an important innovation. But ultimately, I think uh, our, our enforcement of law depends on political leadership, that our, our courts are going to be corrupted by our politicians if the, if the politicians want to subvert the law. Uh, and, uh, and ultimately, I think, uh, uh, our judicial system cannot substitute for the virtue, can, uh, the faults of our political system. Uh, I think the, poli the building, I, I believe our politi building, political, building a successful society begins first with some, have some virtue in our political system. As a believer in democracy, I, I hope to find uh, uh, democratic institutions as, as improving that but I cannot claim, but it's obvious from human history that there have been, most of human history has not been d democratic by the standards of, of America or Thailand today. And uh, we have had governments that have had some virtue uh, and, 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 and the, 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 the great political, our great lit judicial systems developed under autocratic authoritarian rule. The, the, um, English kings are responsible for the development of the English common law that is is so much admired, uh, but uh, but they were they were not democrats. Um, so understanding the secrets of of, of, of successful societies is a, uh, a a very deep one. I have spoken here about issues which this country, I think, is in, in the middle of, literally in the sense that this is a country in which uh, democracy has, has gradually established itself as something very, very deeply in this country. It's been challenged. The, the idea of, of, of leaders being chosen by vote versus leaders being chosen by negotiations among military officers, these are very real alternatives, and I think it's clear in this country that uh, the balance is that the most important thing in choosing the leader should be approval of broad citizens, even though that doesn't guarantee that we're going to get leaders who all of us like. 
on it for in any given attribute and the question of how to make it better. Uh, I think the question of decentralization is something that this country is also in the middle of. There are very real, there is very real political decentralization. Uh, its responsibilities could be increased. I don't know that it should be increased. I, I wanted to use this occasion to at least raise the question and I think the, the judgment I'd like to suggest the, was, was that uh, if, is it possible that if, if provincial councils are given a larger share of responsibilities that 10 or 20 or 30 years from now, the choices that people have, at, voters have at the national level will be in some ways more satisfactory because some but not all of them will be people who had proven themselves uh, by good service at, lower, at the lower levels. That's a question and, uh, and, and obviously I can't know the answer, uh, but it's a privilege to, to at least raise the question today. Okay, um, I think um, I will not accept more questions due to the time. So um, I would like to thank you, um, Professor Meyerson, for his speech. I'm sure you all agree that his talk was very interesting and also it inspire us to ask ourselves what should be done next step for our country as also a voter or a citizen who may be yes. somehow in the future participate in the local election ourselves, some of us. Yes. Um, I would like to invite Associate Professor Sawani Thai Rungrod, President of the University of Thai Chamber of Commerce to present a small token of our appreciation to Professor Meyerson. Our thanks must also be extended to International Peace Foundation, all Bridges event sponsors, Cisco System who broadcast today's events to Myanmar, and definitely to the conference particip participants who are here today with us at UTCC and in Myanmar. Um, let me tell you again that uh, starting from today, there will be several continuous run public events for the Bridges series events in Thailand until March 2013. The detailed program of all Bridges events is available on the International Peace Foundation's website. It has been fantastic time. I've enjoyed today's speech enormously and I'm sure you all have. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again and see you again.